Ditch Diggers, number 14 of season seven. Ditch Diggers appear and ain't no one of here. With some not so nice advice for your writing career, to be clear. No punches will be pulled, but the punch may be spiked. How they like before they get on the mic. To my left, we got the mighty Mer Lafferty. And if I piss her off, believe me, she'll come after me. And her co-host, Matt Evan Wallace, on the right. Yes, she may be half as hype as she could take him in a fight. So settle in, folks. Buckle in and boot up Time to meddle in a way to make your writer shut up It's hard work, but the perk is that it's fun and exciting Facebook will still be there when you're done writing Ditch Diggers! Ditch Diggers! And I am here with Ursula Vernon, who is not Matt, still but uh, Matt is Matt is alive. I got proof of life. I spoke to him this weekend. He is still alive. So um, I believe he's taking his knife fighting skills somewhere in Cincinnati. I'm not sure, but uh, he's still I, uh, wandering. I could, as my job stunt, Matt. I could stab someone. Um, you, you're looking around someone. your garden like there's someone there to stab, and I know you just put the dog inside. Uh, uh, I could prune something. That's like, that's <laughs> close to a stab. They don't even involve sharp objects and you do it in the garden. And the problem that's is true. if I go pruning something, I'll get pruning happy and I won't come back for the rest of the podcast. I'll yeah, just that be would be bad. You know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this is Ditch Diggers. This is the podcast talking about the business side of writing. My normal co-host is taking the summer off and I am here with many, many kind guest co-host today is Ursula Vernon. Last time we spoke, I'm not sure what you had or had not won, but now you have won the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Young Adult Novel, and you have won the uh, Locus Award for Best Young Adult Novel. Yep. It's, which, uh, it's a thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone who voted and, and stuff. I'm, I'm honored. Well, all that's left is the Lodestar, the Not a Hugo Award for Young Adult Writing. And I have decided that that is the triple crown of speculative fiction young adult novels. No one has right. done it before, but that is partly because the Lodestar is so new. Um, Neddy Korofor and uh, Tomi Adeyemi, pardon me if I say that wrong, uh, have come close. But uh, I don't believe the Lodestar wasn't... I don't believe Love Star was a thing then, so uh, they probably would have had it been, been a thing. Been a yeah. thing. But anyway, so you are here. Uh, and yes. You get to wait. Uh, jail, I just, uh, that's it. Five more months. Until... Uh, it sounds like that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that I, great? I, I, honestly, it's weird as a triple crown because it would be like if the racehorses, you know, raced and then took a couple weeks off and raced, and then went off and did other stuff for six yeah. months. So. Oh, no, uh, my moderator, Numbers Ninja, says they both have won the Lodestar, but not won all three. I see. Thank you, Numbers okay. Ninja. Um, just to say hello to folks in the chat, because people are here and talking. The kids are asleep. Shovel is ready. Thank you, the kids are asleep. And the bot seems to be working, which is a big deal. Stephen Kill has subscribed for nine months straight. Have I even been podcast or, or streaming like nine months? I guess I have. Thank you, Stephen. Lovely to see you. Everybody check out Stephen. The bot addict did its job. And uh, you can check out Stephen's uh, stream as well, please. Uh, Octopus Gallery is here. Hello. Cheryl is here. Sesame. I know Octopus Gallery. Yay! I, I've exchanged, uh, I, she was part of an illicit poultry exchange across state lines. Have I heard this story? Have you done more than one of these? I have done several now. Yeah, that's what I figured. He anyway. dropped off ducks. I see. Ducks and <laughs> cat carriers. Underpope is here. Hello, Underpope. And, uh, let's see. You got Ulo Boras. Let's get this goat rodeo on the road before my internet is disconnected seconds from now. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, Bill is here. Sorry you asked if we're supposed to have sound yet. I hope you have sound. Um, Tree Lobster's here. Uh, Underpope has a new computer. 
tree lobsters. Is that a reference to the uh, uh, Lord Howe Island giant stick bug? I don't know. I'll let tree lobsters answer that. Uh, I can't see the chat, but uh, uh, yes. Oh wait, here's here's a chat. Yeah. Tree lobsters. Oh no, wait, that's a, that's only with you because I'm not on Twitch, so I can chat with you, Mer, but I can also just talk to you. True, true. Or you could look on Twitch and see me and see the chat too. But then I'd have to fire up Twitch, and then, you know, I would get confused watching Twitch, and there would be a lag, and it would get yeah. very, very, yeah. Yeah. You you can make it, uh, probably make I, it harder, I, yeah, but... Yeah, I can only handle so many different sources of input. Okay. Oh, oh, Valerie. Illicit Poultry Exchange is the name of my erotica publishing imprint. Cock smuggling was taken. <laughs> Lee is here. Todd is here. <laughs> Oh boy, and Kevin is uh, not, you're sp not supposed to know he's there, but he is talking about illicit emu exchanges, so. Um, we are, oh god, yes, I completely forgot the emu exchange. Oh god. Oh god. Well, Tree Lobsters is, uh, started a webcomic based on the name of the stick insects, the name kind of stuck, so good call, Ursula. So, um, hello to folks in the chat, I'm glad you're here. I have been off stream for about a week, uh, we did a... Fourth of July trip up to my in-laws because we hadn't seen them in a year and a half. So uh, that was it, it. It is strange after just a week away and lots of driving, um, and a lot of hot dogs, and a lot of wine. Um, that that you just completely forget how to stream. So uh, I'm I'm totally here. I believe you, Mer. Thank you. I believe so. in you as well. So, uh, I am here to make you feel uncomfortable about the awards you have won on uh, <laughs> A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. Um, it is uh, an amazing, amazing book, and I think you've told the story twice while I've recorded you doing it, which I assume one of those means on Ditch Diggers, because we also told wow. a story for the ReaderCon GOH interview. If you're going to ReaderCon, ReaderCon is virtual this year, so anybody can go. Ursula is the guest of honor, and I got to do one the of several. guest... What? One of several guests yes. of honor. And uh, I got to do the interview, because we go way back, and I know the uh, triggers to start some of her most entertaining stories, or at least what I think are some of her mo most entertaining stories. Mother knows where all the bodies are buried. Yes. And occasionally helped hold the shovel. Of course I did. And, um... So, yes, you, you were starting on the Wizard's Guide uh, yes. thing. And yes. Yes, so, uh, the book that Ursula bought in order to get a tax write-off for a KitchenAid mixer is now paying off. Okay, uh, wait, I'm going to the tax write-off. I didn't buy the book, I wrote the book, but yes. Right, that. right, right. I'll start yeah. that again. None of that just happened. That just... We're done. We just start over. Okay. Ursula wrote a book in order to get a tax write-off on a KitchenAid stand mixer. Bright and red. The bright red mixer is still there. The book was came out last year. It did very, very, very well. And um, this year she's she's gathering all the awards. Has your nebula come yet? It has not. Uh... I wanted you to just hold it up to the... the, the can. Uh, I, I, I could go get, I, I, oh God, it feels incredibly arrogant to say I, I have yes. a nebula. I could go get it and hold it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I have, sh I, I had all these big, like, glass cases to hold my skull collection. So we just stick the awards in there with the skulls. Stick the awards in there with the skulls. That keeps them, um. I don't know. Humble? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where yeah, I'm going with this. Uh, the, the sort of uh, memento mori thing, or uh, uh, in ancient Rome, when at the height of, you know, when all the crowds were cheering, there was a guy who was paid to whisper in your ear, remember, you two must die. So oh. that you, you know, didn't get hubris. Because once <laughs> you had hubris, the gods were just like, oh, it's done. Yeah. So. Yes, I I've believe... been playing a lot of Hades <laughs> lately, and Hubris, yes. Oh, yeah. You just discovered that Hades' voice is made of sex. Zagreus. Not Hades. Hades Zagreus. is so Why can't I talk today? Oh, my God. I told you, guys, I'm off. I'm off on streaming today. It's just, like, I'm tired. Did you take and... your meds, Mer? 
Shit, no, I didn't. You talk for a second. Okay, so, uh, anyway, uh, I know to say that because Kevin says that to me constantly when I get a little scattered. Did you take your meds? Uh, both Burr and I are on the same meds, I believe, for ADHD, which is a, uh, thing that we both have, and that makes us very easily distracted and prone to aphasia frequently, which is losing words. Of course, most writers, I think, are prone to aphasia because we use all of our words professionally, and then when the time comes to use them in, like, amateur, non-professional context, we're completely out, we've spent them all in the book, so we're just going, the thingy, hand me the thingy, the thing, the you know, thing. You know what, I, yeah. I've, I think this is built up in my head more, because, um... I don't know if anybody's ever expected this from me, but I I dislike word games because I'm not very good at them, but I feel like people expect me to be good at them because I'm a writer, and so then I feel more hatred for them just because I resent them, even though no one said, you love writing, why don't you like Scrabble? And we were playing, we were watching yeah. Wheel of Fortune for the first time in, for me, decades the other night, and um, I'm looking at it going, I don't, I I don't know what any of this is. Up. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, thank you for reminding me because I had not taken my meds today. So um, Kevin wants to know if he needs to fetch the awards. Uh, sorry, I want you to be proud of those awards. Um, uh, and Kevin, if you want to bring a nebula out to the backyard so I can show the internet what one looks like, okay, I guess. Uh, Rainjoy says, Zag is the best. Uh, yes. Yes. So Zagreus' voice is made of sex. Interestingly enough, Scully's is not, and it's the same voice actor. Yes. Uh, yeah. I. I'm. I, I. And it wouldn't work so well if Zagreus, as a character, and this is the game Hades, if you haven't yeah. played it, uh, is very polite. And this is a hack and slash dungeon. So super crawl. polite. Yeah. Even but, the people who are assholes. Yes, he's so nice and like. To everybody, including, you know, like, the the house cleaner and the various people who are trying to kill him. Like, you know, he, he kills all of the, the witches and something, and he's like, well, until next time, ladies. And, and he means <laughs> it when he says it. You know, Theseus is just an ass, and he's yeah. so nice to Theseus. And I'm he like... He's a little salty. With Theseus, he does, but there's the the uh, uh, he's he's always he's trying to stand up for the Minotaur. He's like the Minotaur is worth like half of your thing. Okay, yes, Thank this you, Kevin. is this is a Nebula award. It's a big ass Lucite brick with uh, planets and a galaxy embedded in it. Uh, don't take that through airport security <laughs> unless you want to have a moment. Uh, but you can't put it in your carry in your your checked luggage because the cold differential could make it crack. So yeah. they tell you take it in your carry on, and so I took it in my carry on. And it, first of all, it's very heavy, and secondly, there is a button they can hit to make the little conveyor belt at uh, the screening like turn and shoot the the luggage sideways. And I did not realize that. I thought it was always fixed, but, like, I was going through a hair, and they slammed that button, and all of a sudden, my nebula was halfway across the room. And I'm like... And then it occurred to me, clear plastic brick with things, have slightly denser objects embedded in it. Oh, my God, they think I've got a block of plastic. Yeah. yeah. And I went over, and, you know, uh, the... TSA was was very uh, humorless, and I was like, I will unpack that, and it's an award, and I take it out, and I show them, and they're all like, what is this thing? <laughs> Sorry, I realize some of this will be audio later, so my, my expressions will not come through. They were uh, very puzzled, and finally they were like, I guess you can take that on, and then one of the TSA agents said, congratulations on the awards! So that was... <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, first time I saw that, I thought you could cave in a skull with this. This is oh, this is an yeah. actual weapon. And then Sarah Pinsker wrote, uh, and then there were n minus one, which is a like one of my favorite stories of like the past ten years. And I'm sorry it didn't win more awards, but 
it uh, it's a it's a story about Sarah Pinsker going to a convention of Sarah Pinskers from all the multiverses, yeah. and one of them dies, and she has to figure out which one of herself from which multiverse is the killer. But small spoiler, the murder weapon is a nebula. <laughs> So it's, it's, guys, search for, and then there were N minus, and then parentheses, one. And it's a take on Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. And uh, it's just so good. Worth reading, definitely. Yes, definitely. We are way off topic with Ditch Diggers. I'm going to acknowledge the chat one more time, and then uh, we'll talk about stuff. So we got uh, Rainjoy agreeing with me that Scrabble is terrible. Lee says, words hard, been there, done that. Uh, Tree Lobsters wants a chance to hold up a literary award someday. I hope so too, Tree Lobsters. Uh, you, ah, you have fun. a huge dormer. You could hold that up. Well, yeah, that's in the hall, though. But that, <laughs> that was that was someone else saying the, oh, the opportunity well, to hold. Well, that's opportunity. Yes, yes, we all. Yes. Yes. You um, go, giant stick insect. I believe in you. Yes. It's also fun to lose a word in English but have it in Spanish. Says uh, the kids are asleep. Uh, phased out says the squiggly what's it? I'm assuming we're still talking about the nebula. Can anyone forget the nebula? Uh, that was, I think, supposed to be a spiral galaxy or something. Ah, uh, spiral galaxy phased out. Um, Rainjoy also hates Scrabble. Devo Spice is here. Hello. Um, sometimes Tree Lobsters has to go through the alphabet to try to dig one up. Uh, Sesafet says Meg's voice is even better. I find Meg a little... I hate the term vocal fry, but I believe if you're looking up vocal fry in the dictionary, a picture of Meg from Hades shows up. She's pleasant, but uh, I gotta say, uh, well, I know all of my bisexual friends think Hades is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I am hopelessly straight, so uh, I'm like, yeah, Meg seems neat. Yeah, yeah, but, same. Uh, yeah, not, not too for me. Uh, I mean, I'm a romantic Thanatos, so you know. Who isn't? Oh, does everybody do that? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you can romance all of them. Well, you can romance, like, three of them, right? Well, no, I mean, of the romanceables, you can be with all of them, and they're all just like, cool. Because Zyrus is so polite. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm also hopelessly monogamous. I feel yeah, like yeah. I was feeding on, you know, the other characters. Uh, Steven says the the nebula is so pretty at least he's steven's using the um it's so pretty very adorable uh <laughs> emoticon emoji whatever it is uh let's see the fact that the tsa can't tell the difference between lucite and c4 does not fill me with a lot of confidence well tree lobsters you know that's all just security theater anyway um, yeah how long have we been taking our shoes off and we were told it would be temporary yeah Oh, thank you, Kids Are Asleep. Kids Are Asleep has posted a link to, and then there were N-1, so uh, I recommend everybody go check it out. I'll try to remember to put that in the show notes, if I could find a pen on this writer's desk to remind myself of that. Okay, so, uh, let's see, we got, I once, I once got in, tr Octopus Gallery got in trouble over toothpaste, um, Oh, okay. Live plants. Try taking live plants through. Uh, and I knew it was going to be a thing, so I, like, had a speech prepared. I walked in. I was like, I have four live plants. They were legally obtained. They are native to North America. Uh, they are not on the endangered species list. Here are the species if you need to know them. And they stared at me and, like... I was out of my mind, and I'm like, what, in case there's agricultural concerns, these are all native to Arizona? And they were like, uh, uh, okay. I really wish you had someone following you around to take pictures of people, and then we can get a picture of everybody from the TSA people to the guy you bought your gun from to any new doctor you ever meet. And basically, they're all going to get the same look on their face, which I think is the Ursula look. Now, see, I would tell your husband to do that, but your husband is busy making friends with every other person in the room because that's, that's his superpower. Does. Yes. So, yes. Uh, yeah, Ursula went off and bought a gun to start uh, deer hunting and, of course, baffled the man who sold it to her and... 
Uh, I had I knew nothing of guns. I I still know very little. I don't like them. I don't enjoy them. I was just like, okay, for my own moral reasons. If uh, first of all, I I was going kind of liberal survivalist after Trump got elected, and was like, I would like to learn to hunt deer in case civilization collapses, uh, because otherwise I'd have to keep livestock, and I'm not doing that. And then the other thing was, if I eat meat regularly, which I do. I feel I should be, uh, I, I felt like I should personally have to pull the trigger in order to uh, sort of confront the reality of it. And if I couldn't do that in the moment, then I probably had no business eating meat, was my thought. This applies only to me. I'm not saying any of the rest of you have to, you know, apply to my, you know, subscribe to my weird moral things. So uh, I decided to take up deer hunting. So I called my father, whose goal in life is to hunt everything with hooves at least once. And his first thing was, uh, have you been replaced by a pod person? And then it was, okay, yes, yes, I will teach you this. Oh, my God, yes. Because, you know, he's never had anyone to sort of pass his, his great passion on to. And, uh, but I had to go buy a twenty two to see if I could shoot a gun at all and a 22 is a smaller rifle in this case and so i went to the local hunting shop that had opened up and walked in and said i need to buy something called a 22 do you have that <laughs> and he was like yes and it kind of went from there and i'm like okay great and he's like and he was very professional he was nice he was kind uh, there was no one else in the store, and I think he was worried that he had just opened up and that business was going to be terrible. So he's like, I recommend this model here. And I'm like, great. I need something called a scope put on it. He's like, I can do this. Yes. And I was like, okay. Do I need to, like, have a waiting period or go through a background check? And he's like, it's a 22. <laughs> and I stared at him, and he stared at me. And just this mutual non-comprehension, and I'm like, but I could shoot someone with this. And he's like, don't. <laughs> I'm like, but do I need a, a but don't I need, like, a, a background check or a waiting period? And he's like, it's a 22. Uh, and he's like, you, you, and then he pauses, like, are you a convicted felon? And I'm like, I don't think so, No. <laughs> And I'm like, wait, and then I was had this idea, because I thought for some reason you should have to get like a license for this, like you do for a driver's license. I yeah, mean, you should. You should. So uh, I was like, wait, okay, maybe it's like you can buy a car, but you can't drive it until you have a license. I could buy the gun, but I couldn't shoot it. And it was like, I believe I also need like bullets. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll need a waiting period on that. And he's like, I, I, I sell those. And then he had to check to make sure he did sell those because I had completely flummoxed this poor man. He probably so thought, forgot what he was there to do. Yeah, he, he My could shop. not <laughs> remember that he sold bullets. He like had to reassure himself that, yes, he still had rounds and he sold them to people. And we had, uh, uh, we went through everything and I made him show me all the parts, like, you know, and how they worked and everything. And he was very nice and very polite and i did have to fill out one form which included um are you currently a fugitive from justice and i was like is does anyone ever say yes to this He's yeah like, no. no they don't and there was another part which i filled out correctly which it was like check either this box or this box so i checked the one that applied and he looked at it and he said you did that right and i'm like good he said no one has ever done that right and what i started the question to I, it was it was just like are you a resident in such and such or are or if you are not there uh, fill out this other thing and both of them you could have filled out basically I think it was like put your address in whichever one applies and anyway at that point I started to think I was perhaps not the stupidest person who had ever purchased a gun <laughs> and, uh, so I was like okay now I need a thing to put it in do you have like a a sleeve or a case is like you, you can take the box i don't have any and finally it was done and i i blogged this all up in much greater detail uh and he walked me out to the car and sort of i think trying to reassure me or himself was like you're fine 
you were fine. If you can't figure out how to shoot it, come back here and I have a range and I can show you. And I'm like, great. And uh, yeah, that was my, my gun buying experience of being a liberal buying a gun. I kept thinking they would be able to smell that I voted for Nader once in the 90s. <laughs> Valerie loves the notion that Ursula is a walking manifestation of some very specific kind of lawful chaos that confounds everyone <laughs> around her, and that is the best description of Ursula I've ever, ever heard. Well done, Val. Also, by the way, Val nominated for the Clark Award. That's how you know she's awesome with the words. Congratulations, Val. Congrats um, and good luck. Yes. Wait, the so, Clark Award is still coming, right? It isn't a... Yeah, the nominees okay. were announced last week, I believe. Okay, so good luck then. Yes, it's not a, 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 it was an honor to be nominated. Good luck. Uh, which one was it, Val? You could put your, put put the name. I can't remember which book it was. Uh, it's got to be the, yeah, you, you, you put it in the chat because I don't want to get it wrong because that's embarrassing, but Chilling Effect, yes. Yes. So, uh, please check out. Uh, Val's book. At the same time, you know, you could also buy The Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking, which uh, could be up for the Triple Crown, which is what I'm calling. And I was going to compare you to Secretariat, and then you were going to tell me Secretariat facts. Uh, yes. Also, uh, still not on topic of ditch diggers, but go. Uh, Secretariat was a mutant. Uh, he His heart was like twice the size of an ordinary racehorse's, and normally that is quite, a large heart tends to be fatal, but not in Secretariat's case. He did great. And he also had an extremely flexible spine, which allowed him to do something called a double suspension gallop, where there was a moment uh, in his... There's a moment in every horse's stride where they have all their legs, like, off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were two moments in his because his spine was so flexible. And very, very rare in racehorses. It's, uh, and it lets you go a lot faster, basically, because if you're not touching the ground, you're, you're flying. And... Uh, they think, uh, I want to say, uh, either Seabiscuit or War Admiral uh, might have been able to do it too, but they didn't have good photos. But uh, he, was, uh, he was completely a mutant. Uh, they, when he died, they dissected him and they were like, uh, this horse, a horse like this has never existed before, basically. And that's why he was just won everything. His heart was huge, uh, literally as well as metaphorically. He had the a spine like a cat, uh, yeah, it's, he should probably not have existed, but he did, and that is why he was the greatest racehorse. Sad to say, he did not breed very well. Uh, everybody claims they have descendants of Secretariat. I don't know how many of them are true. Well, I think uh, his, if you say you do, and your horse just runs like a regular horse, it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth or not, because you, you kind of yeah. need those mutant things to continue for any of the Secretariat uh, breathability yeah. to be worth anything. His, uh, by all accounts, his boys could not swim gotcha. very well. So, yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> we should talk about writing, probably, or something related probably. to that. Probably. So, Here's the deal. I, um, I I have a podcast about this called I Should Be Writing, and I discuss this more at length, but I'm doing it with Ursula to transfer to something else now. So if you've heard this, please stick around because we're going in a different direction. But I realized something about myself recently, and that is I have been doing a little bit of self-sabotage because I hold myself back from putting 100% into some of my projects. And I've known that. But I, I, it took me forever to figure out where that, what was making me hold back. And I think it was the, it, it's fear of failure, but it's fear of failure that if I put everything I have into a project and it fails, then that means the project failed. That means you weren't good enough. Exactly. Yeah. And if I did not put anything, everything into it, then I think, well, if I'd tried my best, I could have succeeded. Now I just failed because I'm lazy. Or I ADHD, blame whatever you could, but I knew I didn't put my all into it, so I can blame that. Oh, if I had put that 30% in, then I would have done it. And I essentially realized I'm that guy who's just like, well, I could do that, but I don't want to. And it's just really disgusting. So I've been trying to work through that. And one of the things I've been uh, looking at is admiring people like you and Joanna Penn for everything you do regarding your career. 
I have pretty much been focusing on um, traditional publishing since I got my first deal. I was doing a lot of uh, podcast publishing and a little bit of ebook publishing, you know, 10 years ago, God. And, but since I got my first Orbit deal, I have been pretty much traditionally focused the whole way. And I had admired you because you have like, you have a very strict way of going about your traditional deals and your self-publishing plans. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. How, and you know, knowing that we both have ADHD, how the hell do you do it? Uh, uh, strict how like uh uh i mean i i try to sit down and do a thousand words four days a week or the system fails uh so i guess that's fairly strict and that i go and write you know every day four days a week but uh, i take weekends off i had to learn to take weekends off because uh my word count went down after a point if i just never took any time off uh and I mean, it's my job. I do it because it's my job. So it's the thing I have to go do. And see, I have the opposite problem. Um, I am not a perfectionist. And like a whole bunch of people in, um, who have ADHD are perfectionists. And this is, this is like stand, this is like bog standard classic perfectionism problem, which is, uh, if I don't try, if I don't, uh, I have learned that doing my best and being, it will never be perfect, so I should not try, because if I don't try, then I don't have to worry about the fact it's not perfect. Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but that makes a lot of sense. It, uh, uh, were you a, a gifted kid? Yeah. Gifted they, kid in the uh, 80s. Yes, uh, they, they set us all up for this real well they really um, did yes and, and and i feel like we slag on gifted programs a lot i feel like it also did me a lot of good and god knows the teachers were trying so hard to keep me from you know suffering the fate that eventually befalls us all when we were very bright students and then get to a point where uh, being bright is not enough and suddenly realize we've never learned how to study or work yeah uh, but yeah uh so, no shade on my teachers. They were trying. They didn't know what ADHD looked like in girls. They, you know, I, I, I always feel bad slagging on the programs because they were such wonderful people who were trying so hard and trying to give me the tools. You know, here, uh, use an organizer, things like that. And uh, they tried. What I needed was uh, chemicals, but, you know. And when, it, when is, gosh, your child is so smart? Gosh, your child is so bright. When is that, when is that a put down? Why would they try to avoid saying that? I mean, like exactly, said, they were yeah. doing their best. Your child Very is so smart if she would just apply herself. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, I think three quarters of the people in the chat probably had a chill run down their spine when I said that. <laughs> uh, and certainly many of the listeners, I'm sure. So uh, I kind of went the opposite way, which was I am... Um, uh, my desire is to be so good at everything that I can phone it in and it will still work and be amazing. Uh, this is in some ways perhaps a slightly harder row to hoe because I will have to get really amazing before I can just phone everything in. But then I can spend the rest of my time in the garden. And that's what it's all about. Yes. So, uh, but, but talking on a, on a, on the hybrid thing, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, like yeah. on a so you do a thousand words a day. I see. I know how you get so much written, but you've got to plan out how many how many uh, self published books do you do a year too. Uh, I like to do two. I like to do three if I can do it. Uh, I am coming to grips with the fact I will probably not be doing three this year. Uh, sometimes I can do two and a novella, but. Yeah, it's, uh, it, this year, maybe not. So uh, which how, sorry, hard, to, hard realization for me, but yes. Well, you've also got several books contracted right now. Right, so yeah. basically, as soon as I finish this book that's going to be the self-pub in the next few months, uh, I have to turn around and the next day start working on the, or not start working, but keep working on this horror novel that's due in September. So, uh, yeah. Uh, how do I do it? Um... I can work on multiple projects at a time, and I will, whatever, 
when the deadline is not like right here in my face, I will work on whatever I'm excited about. And so if I have an idea about what, where something goes, I will work on that as long as the excitement takes me and then I will switch to another thing. So, and I get a lot more done when I'm excited. So, you know, I don't always know what the thing that I'm going to be excited about is. Uh, when I am excited about a project, it doesn't matter if it's sold, it doesn't matter if I have immediate plans for it, I will just work on it. And, uh, and then sometimes I, uh, when I, you know, I'll write 1,700 words or 2,000 on it, and then I will be like, okay, I have to go write at least a couple hundred on a project with a deadline. Uh, so I do that, and but it works out because then I usually have a project that I'm like 15 or between 15 and 30,000 words done on. And one of those, for example, uh, Tor has a second fan uh, has been contracted for a second fantasy novel. And so we've been sort of wondering what it should be. And so I was like, hey, have you seen this thing? And sent them a thing that had, I don't know, 15,000 words on it. And, the, and it was like, yes, I love this. I will take this for tour. This will be the second one. Great. And it was just a thing I was excited about a while ago. And then I thought of again and was excited about it. So I wrote more words on it. So I just keep lots of projects lying around. And sometimes... I will get this sudden pang of enthusiasm or realize what the thing is that happens next on that thing and go back and write it. Uh, it also helps, I, and I don't know if this is a duplicatable thing, I write very clean first drafts. I don't have to go through like eight drafts on a project. I write it uh, and pretty much I write the end and I send it to my editor. And so, uh, yeah. Because if I had to sit down and do a second, like I, and I've been doing that since, college, high school, whatever, when, you know, I, I had a teacher, a professor in college once say, you don't write first drafts or second drafts or anything, do you? You just sit down and write the paper. And I'm like, yes. And he was all, okay. Well, it was entertaining to read, so you get a B. That's <laughs> fine. I, I'm not here to, you know, make you, uh, like, I'm your archaeology professor. I'm not here to make you write second drafts. I'm just noticing that so, yeah. um, uh, well, I apologize I for apologize trying to push, trying this, to push this further but no, no, if, you have, have, if you want to do you want two, to two uh, books a year that's self-published do you plan at what point do you say okay this thing I'm excited about that I've got 30,000 words this is going to be my summer book or do you decide I'm going to to publish a book in July, or I mean, how how specifically does that work, or do you just like wait until you are at a point where you're happy about something, and then you think I can probably get it out in a month or so? Uh, it started out. I'm happy about something. I can probably get it out in a month or so. Now it's not like that anymore because I have all these traditional contracts. And I have basically what amounts to non-compete clauses with some of them. Right. So it's uh, don't put anything out within uh, three months after, you know, this book comes out or whatever. And uh, I don't think I'm on three. I don't think I'm at three months with anybody. Saga wanted three months and that was always difficult to work with because they'd lock up like a good chunk of the year. Um, so I have to like sit down and when my editor gave me uh, gives me the basically the timeline of publishing I go okay that I, I just it's a spreadsheet that she sends me and I look at it and I say open a word doc or something and write okay I can put out a, a, there's a slot here where I can put out a book there's a slot here where I can put out a book there's a slot here where I can put out a book and that means I have to write a book by that time period and uh, I could have, I could have, I had two slots for books this year, and I won't swear that the second one won't happen, uh, because that would be like, I think, January of, uh, of 2022, but it's, uh, yeah, it's looking a little dicey, but, and then I just uh, kind of plan for that, and I'm very lucky in that I have a self-published editor who will do rapid turnarounds and who basically just holds an open slot for me. Like, I, I let her know, okay, I think this will be done in June. 
it's rarely done in June. Okay, okay, it's actually going to be July. And uh, she just takes it then and gets it back to me as soon as she can, which is usually, you know, anywhere from uh, a weekend to two, three weeks, depending on what she's got going on. But, uh, yeah, so... And then my uh, the small press that does the print versions, who are lovely, lovely people, Argyle Publications, uh, they are um, actually... Uh, basically, the um, the not furry side of Fur Planet, and uh, I love them to pieces. They uh, will do very rapid turnarounds on print books because uh, not to put too fine a point upon it, it makes them money. So I will be like, I think I will have a book for you in a month. Can we get it out the door in a month? And one of their editors uh, will be like, you know, since I'm handing them an already edited manuscript, essentially, it's just. Uh, uh, set up the storefronts, do the print stuff, get everything, you know, get the, the, uh, the sample copy, the, the oh, arc. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny, they don't send out arcs or anything, but just get the, the one that shows you that the book is actually the book and is not, uh, and somebody didn't accidentally print a cookbook inside it or whatever. Uh, the proofs. And, proofs, uh, yes. And, yeah, so they will do that in, like, very short order now, and I love them for it. I try not to lay that on them when they're in the middle of, like, hyper-convention season, because that's just cruel. If they're like, yeah, we got a con every weekend, and you want us to do a book release thing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So yeah. I'm, I have, I'm surrounded by people who are willing to work fast, and I sort of have a vague schedule, but because I have ADHD, my sense of time is really bad for the most part, yeah. so... I, uh, all I, I have a vague idea, okay, I should be working on something at the end of, uh, you know, in September, once I've turned in this horror novel, I should definitely start working on something to come out in January. Uh, is it going to be the, uh, the next Paladin book? Well, okay, no, I've got a lot of work on the next Paladin book, it's only 10,000 words along and it'll want to be a hundred thousand so that's like you know okay that's a lot maybe a novella okay let, and then it'll just come down to what i'm excited about writing so, so yeah it's, it's much more slapdash than it looks on the outside yeah. um so i know that you and your agent have an interesting relationship because you seem to have a relationship interesting relationship with almost everybody in your life but for people who think that they would like to have the bonus of um self-publishing is monthly paychecks whereas oh, yeah. when you are uh, traditionally published you get your advances and then you get, when you when you earn out your royalties usually come about twice a year so uh that is one big reason to be a hybrid author but um how do you deal how, how do you introduce this to your agent what what happens when you think i mean i know that the defensive baking was a long saga of selling the rights and then getting them back and then et cetera. But overall, when, how do you approach your agent with this plan? Uh, I basically, we had a, uh, it started easily enough. We had a novella that uh, we couldn't sell anywhere. That was Nine Goblins. People liked it, but they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, we had one editor who was like, I would like this, but you'd have to cut out all of these little random world building asides you do. And I'm like, I believe that means you don't actually want the book. Yeah. And uh, because, like, I know my readers well enough to know they love the word random world building. Aside, that's half of what you you read my stuff. So I'm like, okay, not a good fit there. And finally, I was like, Helen, my agent's name is Helen. How about I just self-publish this thing? And she's like, I think that would be a good idea. And later on, you know, we had other books that it was similar, uh, and. Then I just started writing stuff specifically for self-pub. And I was like, okay. Um, I told her, look, I love having you as an agent. You do great things for me as an agent. I want you to keep being my agent. I'm not going to complete, you know, self-pub forever. But how about I self-pub some of these things? And then if anybody comes asking for audio rights or, or foreign rights or anything, it's all you. And because I want to keep working with you, you're great. I just have this, uh, you know, obviously I have a lot of stuff that appeals to just a large enough audience that my self-publish, is, it's worth self-publishing for me, but not a large enough audience that editors know how to sell it, so for traditional publishing. 
And she basically said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. So uh, we just had the conversation and it was easy. You know, I said, I, I'm not trying to get rid of you. I'm not, I, I want to continue being trade published, but this is, you know, uh, I have all this stuff that doesn't fit into neatly into this. So why don't I do that? And you stay involved once it gets out there. And she was like, yes, let us do that. And in fact, she has sold foreign rights for a lot of my books. And uh, she pitches self-pub books of mine to uh, movie people. And she's uh, uh, handled all of the audio rights with, uh, with Tanter and uh, who all. So, uh, yeah, she's still involved. You know, she doesn't get the big chunk of the advance uh, money, basically. But she's on... Uh, all of the smaller contracts that, you know, bring in uh, small amounts of money fairly regularly. And I'm sure it's not much. You know, you're never going to get rich on audio self-pub usually, but 50, 60 bucks here and there, it all adds, uh, you know, once a quarter adds up over time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, and a lot of being an agent is, you know, taking... Uh, is, I, I guess working sort of uh, pro bono and hoping that uh, that some of this makes money. So uh, I think it would be different maybe if I had gone completely self pub and sworn off trade publishing. But sure. uh, no, we we just had the conversation and I was up front. You're great at what you do. I don't want to do any of that. And one of the the early days of self pub were uh, different. And uh, contentious. And one of the things that the big rallying cry was, fire your agent, fire your agent. I'm not going to fire my agent. I don't want to read those contracts myself. Yeah. I'm not an entertainment lawyer. Uh, and I actually got into it with someone once who was going on, you know, there's no reason you need an agent. They're just blood suckers taking 15%. And I'm like, I would pay her a lot more than 15% to read the contracts and deal with them for me. I don't want to do that. I want to sit in a room and write. And yes, I had to learn, you know, the basics of ebook formatting and whatnot for uh, uh, self-pub to uh, put out the books now. Uh, Vellum, if you're on Mac, Vellum is great. And, uh, but also draft to digital. Uh, which is a website. It's a distributor. Distributes the books to everybody. You can uh, you do Kindle and you do Draft to Digital and you cover ninety nine percent of the bases. Uh, these, these links will be in the show notes. Yes, uh, Draft to Digital is very easy to use. I stopped using Smashwords. Um, I still have a couple books on Smashwords because I haven't bothered to take them down. But their Meat Grinder was a uh, uh, was aptly named. And I never liked what they did, and I never made much money there. There is a thing that will drop my books directly in the Kobo store or the Nook store, or whatever. Yeah, sign me up. And library. I haven't had, I haven't had good luck with with Smashwords because I inevitably I would format a book and I would upload it. And it would be like this book is accepted, and we're gonna put it over here, here, and here. And then like two weeks later, I would get a what of your books does not meet our requirements. I'm like, you just accepted it. Yep. Like, nope, we don't like it anymore. And this happened over and over again. And finally, I just, I rage quit. I'm like, no, I, I don't care. And every once in a while, they're like, hey, one of your books is not pro uh, yeah, oh, I it for our site. Come fix it. And I'm like, no, go away. Yeah. No, Where and it? Their, uh, the, their, um, their royalty statements were just a royal pain in the ass to decipher, too. Whereas I can go to draft to digital click a thing, get a bar graph, basically. And that says, in the last month, you sold X copies. And you'd think that would be extremely easy to get on Smashwords, but it turns out not so much. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, draft to digital is great. They've been super professional. Like, at one point, um, I get an email from them. Uh, this was back in the early days, that is like, we're coming up on Thanksgiving, and uh, we're sending our staff home so they can have Thanksgiving with their families. So if there's anything you want to get in, uh, and this is like two weeks before, get it in now or expect to possibly have delays. Uh, we're hoping there won't be, but the staff needs Thanksgiving off. I'm like, this is the only... I have never had anyone, like, 
in in the the self pub you know website distributor thing ever be like hey get stuff in early because this thing is upcoming and it's a nice thing not our yeah. computers all crashed so yeah i i am very happy with them and it's also showing that they treat their workers well yeah so yeah it's been uh, it's been great i i have no complaints with them i'm sure they'll get bought by you know somebody soon and then we will all be sad but yeah. uh, at the moment they're good yeah so uh I have no idea if I've answered your questions or not. I think so. I mean, I've just wanted to go through. Uh, uh, it's a lot of questions I personally have because I'm trying to think go if I it. am going to do, put everything I can into my projects. Um, there are some self-publishing things I'm considering, and I no, need to figure out absolutely self-published turkey and string. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah, uh, Turkey and String, I actually pitched that to uh, Tor.com, and they said, we like everything about this except for the Turkey and String part. And I'm like, Damn it, Tor. then you just want, like, a noir crime novel, and that's not what I was going to write, because I, I, yeah. I, the, the weird thing was the fact that, that that was the thing that made it stand out, and you want me to not do that. Okay. Yeah, so Ursula, many, many, many years ago... Came we up with the drunk. idea of. He you and I were, were at a party. We were drinking, and we we no. came up with it was a, a, like uh, oh yeah um I was explaining uh, doing uh, school visits and coming up with ideas you know explaining how easy it is to come up with ideas to kids and I was like if first comes to worst pick two random objects they fight crime and we wound up with turkey and string I think you were in Bombay fight crime and then we started going about how it was like a comic. With, you know, string is just dangling from the top of the panel, not apparently attached to anything. And Turkey, and they're both, you know, they're, they're hard bitten cops, and Turkey is always yelling, String, they'll have your badge for that. Oh my God, String, put that man down. It's just a picture of a man on the ground with a string laying on him. And, yeah, uh, yeah and Murr decided this would make a brilliant noir tech crime novel. And, uh, yeah. It didn't work. But it totally it worked. I didn't sell it then. I can, yes. I can try to I can try to try to sell it again. Basically, I had my my concept well, was you there's try a to sell uh, it again. You write that thing and you self publish it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The concept is there's a a new new tech to uh, take problem solving um, problem solving detectives and put them into people's minds only the main character has a faulty piece of software and gets a turkey. And all the turkey wants to do is talk about the glory days of fighting crime with String and all of String's secrets. Yeah. Like, you know, that it, it's String's mom was a, a violin bow string and, and uh, violin E string and... Um, I forget what else we did a lot of stuff so yeah and, and it was it was brilliant because most people had like like Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot and yeah. and uh, they and your poor characters wandering around trying not to let anybody know that what they've got is this you know uh, is this defective police turkey and mm -hmm. yeah it, it was it was genius the, the, the chat is on board, which is good. Uh, Devo Spice has also offered <laughs> to do a parody of Lizard and Fish and turn it into Turkey and String. So uh, Argyle, uh, as I recall from a, a, a drunken pitch session, when I made you tell them the story, was like, uh, write this book and we will publish it. So That's true, yeah. they were. I should, I, okay. I'll, I mean, I'll... it's a small press thing, and you can totally do the ebook yourself and have them handle all the print stuff. That's what I do. So it's a sort of joint publishing venture between me and them, but uh, yeah. Yeah, again, I think it's one of those. Well, it's it, it's really weird, and I could put all I could put my all into it and see if it flies or fails, fly like a turkey or get eaten like a turkey, or or I could just fall. like dream about it for year after year after year and just say that it didn't work because I didn't do it, and now. Well, that's time fine. is always a factor. You know, there, there's only so many projects you can work on. Like, 
I've been saying for years I try to write the book about the corn god going mad from disrespect, although I actually am writing that, but Thor passed on it. They were like, I don't know about this, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll self-publish it one of these days. Or send yes. it to uh, uh, Subterranean Keeps Poking Me for a horror novel. Or a horror novella. Are you going to make the corn god mad because of disrespect into a horror novella? Oh, it would have to be, wouldn't it? I mean, corn is inherently scary. It wouldn't creepy. have to. I don't know. No, corn is corn is inherently scary. Corn feels I mean, terrifying. I, I just recently reread Children of the Corn. But, yeah. So we got, uh, Veil Who Fights Cats has just arrived. Chose a stra strange time to join the stream. I heard turkeys and poirot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're talking about a, writing a story about a turkey whose old partner was a piece of string. And, yeah. Solving got, crime. Corn is evil, corn mazes are the worst. We got, we got people on board that uh, corn is bad, so clearly I'm wrong. I'm sorry. No, I mean, corn is, I mean, ears of corn are not going to do anything to you, really, but corn mazes are frightening, corn fields are frightening. Uh, I was on board to be scared of the movie Signs when it was just the alien ankle disappearing into the cornfield, and then they had to put the rest of the movie on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was the one where water was the... Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a species who melts in water, and you come to a planet that is... 70%? 70 yeah. with, where water falls from the sky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why? Actually, you know what signs should have been? It should have been Dragon Riders of Pern, only they were the people coming to here. Yeah, it's Earth, like Thread, Earth was Thread. Thread. Yeah, it's yeah. like, hey, we're going to come here. It's going to be great. And then, you know, Thread starts falling from the sky and they melt. It's the same thing. It's just like Anne McCaffrey, only without dragons and with Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, that's, that is, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am gobsmacked at the, <laughs> analogy uh that's yeah, how i'm gonna sell it it's it's yeah it's just like dragon riders <laughs> of pern only without the big telepathic dragons which are frankly the reason everyone read the pern books thread was just the excuse to give you big telepathic dragons yeah 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 so uh we have been going on for quite some time and i've been delighted that everyone's been hanging around with us is uh Oh, that may be the absolute best mirth sentence and the most mirth thing ever. <laughs> I don't know which one you mean, Larry, but thank you. Which specific one? Um, any I'm, burning questions from the chat? I yeah, suppose? I was going to say, if, if there's any questions you have uh, for Ursula or ditch digging in general or in specific, we are here for you. Um, I believe Ursula is going to be a guest host at least once more uh, in August so if you have any questions, if you're listening to this later and you have a question for Ursula, ask it and I will save it for that time. I feel a little bad that every time I'm on Ditch Diggers, we wind up just talking about me. And I'm like, but Ditch Diggers is like a show about, you know, uh, uh, the business of writing and you, Murray, and, and what, are you, what are you working on lately? <laughs> I am working on um, my novella that is... Uh, essentially Blue's Clues meets 1984 and um, I'm on the third rewrite of that and I think it's going well. I'm a little I'm losing a little bit of self-confidence there but uh, Once you hit the third rewrite it's hard to keep the, the do I know what I'm doing thing. I hope they're paying you well for it. They are but okay. it's, it's just one of those like you always want to know what other people are going through. You want to know how other people's rewrites are requested. It's like uh, Paolo Bacigalupi once told me that, that the rewrites for Wind Up Girl involved him taking out an entire character. And it was like he had to do, like, he had to go into somebody's body cavity and remove, like, take everything out and remove, like, one thing and then pack everything back in to where it was still a body that worked. He said it with more gross things, I think. But essentially, it was like how hard it was to undo all of that and then like take that one thing out and then put it all back together again so it worked. And so it was like things like that make me feel good. And then you're not supposed to 
compare yourself to other people. It's just, it's, it's me. I'm at this point in my life after a global pandemic and other things are going on that have affected me and my mental capacity. And right now it's taking me several drafts to get this book where it needs to be. And I'm still just like doubting everything. So that's fun. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I, it certainly made me a better outliner for sure. Because at this point, I want to have, want to make sure that the editor and I are on the same page before I go forward again with it. So, um, yeah, that's what I I'm working to do on. I that with, with uh, children's books mostly, where I would get in and they would be like, "Okay, so you need to. Ch this is not gonna fly." Uh, it was the one, uh, I think it was, God, the, the Giant Trouble, the Hamster Princess book really gave us trouble. I wanted the uh, magical harp who'd been held prisoner by the giant to just burn the castle down. And, uh, <laughs> uh, she's like standing there with a match going, just try me. And uh, my editor said very politely that um, we were not allowed to have arson as a major plot point. <laughs> And that this was uh, uh, a little too maniacal, I believe was her exact phrase. So I needed to figure something else out. So I had to rewrite the entire like second half of the book. And I wanted to kill off the giant because, of course, the giant dies in Jack and the Beanstalk. Yeah, and she false. Was like, yeah, she was like, no, can't kill him. So he had to fall, throw his back out, and uh, be... <laughs> Uh, just uh, be going muscle relaxants, bring me a muscle relaxant the size yeah. of a battleship. And was confined to bed with his only reading material, things like why we do not keep sentient magic harps enslaved in our house. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, I had to introduce, like, a deus ex machina for that one. Mm. Uh, which was the bean seller, as it turned out, so it worked. But, um, okay. yeah, it was, no, I, I had to, like, Read your thing, and I got discouraged, and I was annoyed. I, I was like, uh, part of that was, you know, you are interfering with my vision, which involves arson, damn it. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I did it because it was money. Yeah. I still don't know if the book is better for that, but it was publishable and money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you in the chat. Uh, Skunk Bomb says, Your books often have animal companions. How do you pick which animal to use in a story? Uh, and Kevin, if you're still around and you want to tell people about why GMs never give, never should give Ursula a companion in D&D, &D, go ahead and tell that on the side. But Ursula, tell us the story about fiction. Uh... It, I, I would like to say that, you know, I have some, like, very professional or possibly mystical process whereby I pick, but I don't. Uh, the hedgehog in Seventh Bride showed up because something had to come out of the bushes, and I was like, hedgehogs are cute, and then became a sort of major companion animal, this hedgehog that communicates in mime, and uh, is sort of magic, but sort of, and, and it was great. Because and I am I am a pantser, not a plotter. Uh, I do not outline. So I realized, like, once I had the hedgehog in place, that I could do something with slugs because hedgehogs eat slugs. So I have this entire like magical sequence where all the hedgehogs summon the uh, the uh, the slugs who eat through the uh, plants that have grown up to block her in with the uh, horrible. Gollum wife of Bluebeard that has been a scarecrow hung on a rack for years, slowly desiccating, uh, but is still sentient. Uh, it wasn't a children's book, despite the hedgehogs. I thought it was when I wrote it, and everyone, was, the editor was like, I don't think this is a children's book. My agent was like, ha ha, this is not a children's book. <laughs> and uh, then later we got to play with myself, by the editor, and Kevin, at what point did you stop believing this was a children's book? Anyway, uh, so yeah, it was just a hedgehog was what came out of the bushes, so that's what I used. Uh, dog and cat were easy. The uh, uh, I, in uh, the twisted ones, there is a coonhound. I had just gotten a coonhound. They're lovely, flatulent dogs. I was, you know, madly in love with the breed, and 
I uh, still am. They're delightful. They're not smart, but if you get the lazy ones, they just hang out and are cuddly and lovely. Uh, so I wrote him in, uh, Bongo the dog in, and he was just, I just had him act like a dog. And there was a point where, uh, there's a point in every horror novel where the question is, why doesn't the protagonist just say, oh, fuck this, and walk? Mm -hmm. Because obviously you would 99% of the time. Uh, and the two basic reasons not to do that are because someone you love is in danger or because you can't get out because you're in a spaceship or grinding poverty, you can't leave. Although in many of these, it's like, no, I, I'm just going to go, uh, you know, I, I will live in a box next to Walmart before I stay in this house. Uh, very few people make that choice. But, and of course you can't have the hero do that because then it's a very short book. It's that yeah. then you go flying the ring to Gondor. I mean, how many haunted house stories would there be where the hero is like, Something scary happened, and the hero said, nope, I'm out of here. Yeah, just standing on the porch going, no, I'm good, I'm gonna sleep in my car. Later. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so the heroine had to stay, and I figured, and, you know, I thought back to Alien and Ripley and the cat, and was like, okay, Bongo has, the dog has gone missing, you can't leave while your dog is out there. Because, of course you can't leave while the dog's out there, you gotta go back for the cat, or go back for the dog. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Bo the Cat in Hollow Places was just started as kind of a bit of local color in the museum and eventually became kind of moved the plot along a bit because uh, he was a large, takes no crap tomcat, uh, mm -hmm. much like one I had once. So, uh, yeah, I, the Animal Companions, they just kind of show up and then uh, the story frequently they, they become important to the story later on I don't like start out going I will require a character who will move the plot along in these following ways I will consult my handy chart of species and say that her companion should be an ostrich yeah I, I don't have anything like that but uh, yeah Ansel Ansela wants to know any plan to, to release a wizard's guide audiobook uh, yes. It's it's being recorded now, I think. Um, it, it should be out very shortly. Uh, for, uh, we've the right, Tanter has it, we heard the, uh, we, I picked the narrator, so yeah, uh, soon. Um, I don't know if they, are, the, the VODs are still up, because it's been a while, but I know that um, the EA podcast team, Alistair Stewart, read A Wizard's Guide, several months ago on their stream so um just check out ea podcast and see if you can still see it there um and if you can't get that one um they, they did nine goblins quite recently so yes yes which is did. also fun um let's see now we have kevin telling people about how wonderful it is to gm you and how much he loves it so very much um he killed my character monday oh <gasps> i did in, not know that kevin in, well it was a mind flayer who critted its brain extraction role on me. Um, 20 D10 damage and uh, just sucked the brain right out of my barbarian skull. And you couldn't make friends with it? Uh, Come no. on. Making friends with a mind flayer, doesn't that sound like the most Ursula thing ever? I mean, I, I had you once having... Died. I once had you making friends with a gelatinous cube, and you drew it for me. I don't even know where that is now, but I love that <laughs> drawing so much. Yes, I, I, my, well, you know, uh, like many parties, we try to adopt everything as pets. Uh, this party is not quite as bad for that. The previous group where I, the previous one where I played a paladin, uh, we tried to convert and adopt everything and succeeded a lot because my paladin had a really ridiculous high charisma. Uh, but this one, I'm playing a barbarian who is, I try to be an asshole, it doesn't always go so well because then I feel guilty about it, but, uh, yeah, so, no, Mind Flayer just popped my brain out and chomped on it, and, uh, my best argument that barbarians do not actually require their brain did not, uh, no. And you don't, as it happens, get a death saving throw when your brain has been extracted. You, uh, you don't come back from that one. Uh, we need to, I think our next session we have to kill the Mind Flayer, 
pull the brain out of its stomach or craw or wherever it is, stuff it back in the barbarian, and that will allow us to use raised dead, because raised dead doesn't work if they're missing organs necessary to life. Like a brain. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I needed felt, to make sure that, yeah, yeah, like a brain. I felt kind of bad for Kevin, honestly, because that moment is the GM when you discover that you have just critted, and he couldn't fudge it because we were playing online, and so all the rules show up as he does them, and I am sure his he he was just aghast at what the dice had done. Uh, yeah. I did not make him sleep on the couch or anything. Oh, that's good. The guys do what they will. Oh, Numbers Ninja says uh, they have the drawing. Yay! The, the, the gelatinous cube. It's, uh, I believe it was trying to wave, so it was getting a, a, a an arm, from a skeletal arm out of its own oh, self yes. and kind of yes. wave. Oh, no, it was at a con and it was it asking you questions. Yeah. That's what oh, it yeah. was. It was sitting in the front, waving a disembodied skeletal arm to get your attention. I don't know how we came up with this, but that that was a thing. It sounds like wow. a thing we do at a con. It does. It does. And, you know, if I do turkey and string, we're going to have to do um, our where anglerfish story. Which is still genius. I just We just need time to work on it. Yes. You, you know where what the problem is. What? The problem is porn. Like... We, we we start thinking where we, we started thinking where Englishfish porn because werewolves and erotica and self pub were really hot when we came up with this idea. Yeah, and we I think it's thinking erotica, I think more than porn, but yes. It's more fun to say porn. Okay, that's true. So but basically when we started plotting it out, it started being like much larger than Anglerfish well, porn, and yeah, so we, we, neither of us were willing to have just a super flimsy excuse to get them together and fucking. We needed like a, a reason why the anglerfish would meet up with the other character who, and of course, if he was the male anglerfish, where's the female anglerfish? Oh, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and uh, and I wanted the heroine to be aware of sperm whale, and yeah, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, and, and honestly, I think the, the support group for where We started animals, with the support group. That's where we yeah. went wrong. Yeah, because it was it, 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 the scope creep. That was the problem. Scope creep. Yeah, so basically it started to have a, a actual plot more than porn. And so we still joke that it's where anglerfish porn, but we don't. I don't want to do the porn part. I just want to write the... the uh, still, it's about a very, very powerful billionaire alpha male getting bit to become the most submissive male in all of all of all of people species um all of animal kingdom yeah and the woman who did that to him and the woman who's gonna save him that's really the porn part is not as important as i mean i assumed you would be writing all of those because writing sex scenes is very hard for me yeah i just no i can't I don't know. Especially, I, I, I mean, anglerfish sex. It's not, oh, <laughs> I can't make that hot. Oh, no, no, I don't think no. that's the, no, that's the horror part, no. But, yeah. No, I, I always leave the sex scenes for, like, next to last. Uh, I will sometimes write the endings before the sex scenes, because I'll just be sitting there going, oh, God, yeah. I have to come up with some way to make this, like, it doesn't even have to be hot, but it has to be not super cheesy and groan-worthy. Mm-hmm. We do have, uh, Distracted Librarian has offered uh, porn ghostwriting in the <laughs> chat. So, thank you, Distracted Librarian. I'll, I'll let you know if we decide to go in that way. But it was it was just the <laughs> most fun idea of, of where stories and billionaire dudes and... Yeah, know. trying to turn the, the genre on its head. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many ideas, so little time. Exactly. Fade to black is your friend. I don't... But see, the thing is, if you're trying to do a Fifty Shades type story, I don't think... Fade to... I don't think there's a lot of Fade to Black in there. Yeah, if, we're, if we were selling it as, you know, uh, erotica, we would get angry letters. Yeah. Uh, we also have some discussion on how to... How, how you get turned into a warehouse. Like, get getting 
bitten by a warehouse. So that's oh oh yes different. Uh, uh, well, I had uh, I had a warehouse character in in uh, Summer in Orcus who was a wolf by day and a house by night, and uh, he. Uh, one of the ways you can get turned into a werewolf historically, uh, mythologically, uh, it wasn't always get bit by a werewolf. You could drink at a stream where wolves drink. You could eat a wolf's brain. Um, you could, uh, uh, I think a, a man in the woods could uh, give you a wolf pelt, and uh, that was a sort of deal with the devil thing. Uh, so I like the one about drinking where wolves drank, so the wolf drank where the houses came down to drink. And uh, so that meant, therefore, that it implied there were migratory houses in the world, and uh, there, were, there were, you know, lots of, of uh, migratory houses uh, stampeding across the, the plains, and the, of course, all the best manor houses had been... Uh, uh, had been taken as trophies, you know, and they had like fifty point cornices, and uh, instead of, instead of uh, uh, antlers, and yeah, it was fun. Yeah, that was a fun book because I could just throw every nonsensical thing I had ever thought of in there, and uh, uh, it would work. It was it was sort of a world made up of odds and ends. Yes. Um. Sorry, uh, Fuzzwolf is trying to post the link to uh, Wizard's Guide audiobook, and I'm trying to figure out how to let Fuzzwolf post a link. Um, I'm still, I'm almost a year into this, and I'm still not entirely sure. It's, it's that I uh, yes. don't have Nightbot. Because um, I got rid of Nightbot because Nightbot was stupid. That's, of course. Curse you, Nightbot! Exactly. Um, I have no idea what Nightbot is. Hang <laughs> Thank you anyway. There's a hummingbird on my, uh, my Sophia, uh, so yay for that. I think it's a female, it's a ruby throat, but it doesn't have the bright ruby throat, so it's probably a female or a juvenile. Or not a ruby throat, because if it doesn't uh, have a ruby throat. Ah, uh, yes, but on the east coast we only have a ruby throats. Oh, okay. Uh, the, once in a blue moon a calliope will show up, but, uh, they look very different. Um, so yeah, they're all ruby-throated hummingbirds here. <laughs> uh, Fuzzwolf, you are allowed to post a link to the audiobook now, if you like. Um, Yay! Yeah, so I'm... But, you know, what I realize is that now that we're both vaccinated, we can do... Like, we can get together and write again. Remember that? Oh my god, Remember? yes! I had forgotten that completely. We used to go to, like, we would go have lunch, and then we'd go to the Barnes & Noble, and then we would write for, like, an hour, and it yeah. was awesome! Yeah, yeah. And we would we would look at the the books and see all all the cloak guy and now cloak guy yeah. has been has been uh, replaced by coat woman showing her back. Ah yes, I sent you pictures, uh, didn't I? I was in Target, so, and every yeah. single book had a woman in a coat with her back to the 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 point of view. It's like just women walking away. Oh, sometimes one, sometimes a lot of them. Just every single story now. Instead of a guy with a cloak, it has a woman in like a... And these are not speculative stories. These are just like fiction. But Yeah, so, uh, speculative if, fiction was all cloak guy all the time for like years. Yes. And uh, and you've seen cloak guy probably. You, you know him well. He was on every cover. Uh, and hey, I get it. Cloaks are great visual elements. Mm -hmm. You get this nice color sweep you can do. It's, it's fabulous. It's mysterious. Yeah, uh, and then YA was uh, Feather. You you had a feather. Right. Yeah. Big feather. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Is this yeah. better or worse than the woman with tattoos covers? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the woman with tattoos. Is that the with woman tattoos? with her back to the, the camera? Yeah, she, she had tattoos. Around? About half the time she had a katana. And yeah. uh, that was every, every urban fantasy cover for, uh, for years was uh, uh, tattooed woman, back to camera, weaponry. Yeah. Yes. Good times. Well, and you know this, is, this is actually somewhat important if you're a writer, uh, ironically enough, because if you're doing self-pub, you want a cover that tells people what is in the book. And so that the readers who want what is in your book get that book. You don't want, you don't actually want a strikingly different cover 
that is different than everything else unless it is really freaking striking because uh, you want a cover that tells, that advertises what kind of book in what genre the reader is getting so that people who want that book buy the book. Uh, don't think of it as art. Think of it as advertising. Yeah, there are very bad pieces of art that are great covers and very good pieces of art that are terrible covers. There are covers that sell the book and don't actually say what's inside the book. So yeah, I, I've learned to just... I defer pretty much. Um, the one time I complained about a cover, I liked the one they gave me and as a response less so i just stopped I'm like you're you're the you're the pros i i'm not a visual person i don't know from nothing about covers so i mean i i, I know yeah, that the that's uh, not a great cover i i felt that they really they really shorted you on it yeah the the it's fa it's fascinating the different the different covers i've gotten on that book um because of all the the foreign rights um, the U Titans UK covers for my books are, without uh, uh, exception, just exquisite. Like, the one they did for the Hollow Places, I was like, I want to rub this book on my body. <laughs> it was, I mean, it yeah. was so good. And They did the Escape, Art, the escape Pod anthology, and the, the cover's really beautiful. Yeah, they, they have, like... And maybe they have multiple artists, but, like, I have gone to, to a Titan party, and I think I ran into the, the I don't know, the head editor or something, and I was like, your cover artist is amazing. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's so, so, yeah, she's really good. Everybody says that. And I'm going, I probably shouldn't ask you if she takes freelance work on the side. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, they, they uh, that was actually a big factor when, um, Tor uh, was figuring out who would do the uh, the UK rights, uh, basically who licensed it to, both Orbit and Titan wanted it, and I had already worked with Titan, they had done great covers, and I was like, I would like to keep working with Titan because they are amazing. Uh, so, yeah. Your husband and my child are redeeming channel points that say hydrate, and I think it's for both of us, so you should hydrate now. Um. Larry Dixon would like to say, I know some Your stuff. Husband, I am out of, of beverage if you would like to bring me another one. <laughs> Larry Dixon, yes, I know that guy. It says, I know some stuff about doing book covers. Uh, I, I am picturing our anglerfish uh, cover as um, a very dominant type woman with like a man's leg sticking out of her shoulder or something. <laughs> Or maybe I, I, have her look like a truck with just truck nuts on it. I don't know. I I was... Well, here Kim, here's the problem. I can think of a really good cover idea that uh, would be like... <laughs> you probably won. Uh, <laughs> I can think of a really good cover idea that would be a great cover for a book, but it would not be a good erotica cover. Like, um, you could do like a... a stylized sperm whale kind of thing with a style, you know, chasing the style, very cartoony, the anglerfish chasing the little tiny anglerfish and, or, you know, mouths open kind of thing. And it would be a good cover, but it would not sell it as erotica. Are we and, still going on erotica? Because I'm thinking that was what slowed us down. So unless we're going to hire a distracted librarian to write our sex scenes, I think we should maybe just do it we, it's it's the support group you know it's about the support group the minute we wrote the support group it's like oh yeah the the collie and the spider are much more interesting than this like b billionaire asshole yeah the the obviously the the sort of group leader was a Blair border collie who was like okay the time okay with well, the minutes we have the minutes all right let's go let's Spider's move on the minutes that. yep yeah yeah distracted librarian says my rates are very reasonable we'll let you know We'll, we'll let you know, yes. <laughs> We'd still have to write more than the first chapter, I think. Yeah, yeah, but now we can get together, and so I'm excited about that. We could talk about that off stream, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think I'm think i about done. I, I, You know I could talk to you for hours, so... Uh, especially since we haven't been able to hang out very much in the past 18 months. So, um, I've seen you more on the camera than in person, but... Uh, is there anything else you want to discuss about ditch digging or 
No, I'm not going to open up the animal fact. Um, no, no, don't uh, open the Pandora's box. box. You just Pandora's save box. whatever animal facts you've got for the next one. Oh, uh, Larry wants to say there need to be a motive for there to be a sex as a life focus. So, you know, the story's about a thirsty-ass anglerfish. There'd be erotica. This is this is such a normal sentence. Yes. I think thirsty-ass anglerfish is redundant. Sorry, Larry, wants us to keep going because uh, three more hours to kill. Yeah, uh, that's Larry Dixon, who is married to Mercedes Lackey, who wrote the books that I grew up on, who is now commenting on my proposed rare anglerfish billionaire erotica. Yep. And, uh, yeah, this is like the weirdest circle of life that, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know what we're holding aloft over the savannah. Maybe an anglerfish. Uh, yes. With truck nuts. Oh, my God. I, I, I would have, I would have draw, somebody draw that for me. Just, just, <laughs> Numbers Ninja, if you got the rest of the afternoon free, it just. Did, you can just Photoshop an anglerfish into the, the Simba pose. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Oh, and my Dixie God. Got, I'm trying to think of uh, uh, something recently that might be of use to anyone. Um, uh, I, I had a, a reminder that publishing timetables move slow frequently. Uh, we pitched a book in January, and I think it was last month that they finally got back to us with thoughts, which was, yes, we would like this book. Uh, we would like a series, and it is a, a children's book again, and... Uh, I have burned out on illustrating them. I, I am I am done. If I have to do that again, I will die. So uh, we were very clear, you hire an artist and I will write anything you want. And so it, uh, it took like six months before they got back to us, but that didn't mean it was a rejection. It just meant that there's a global pandemic and my editor was working at home with literally four small children. Uh, and uh, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was like, yeah, my husband and I are taking, you know, morning and evening shifts, keeping the kids uh, entertained and fed and whatnot. But you got four toddlers, basically. Uh, you're, you're... I don't expect you to get back to me, like, super fast under those circumstances. And it was nice, though, though because we talked about it. Uh, we had a Zoom call where... None of us turned our cameras on, and we're all like, yeah, we've, we've had to put on makeup too many times for Zoom calls. Let's just go by voice. We know what each other looks like. And uh, chatted about it, and it was great. Uh, we're, they're hammering out an offer now, I think. My agent will be you know, working on that for a while. So I'm excited uh, to... Well, part of the, the motivation for that was to buy back another book that they have been sitting on for a couple of years, much like Wizard's Guide, that started and they were working on it, and then it got to a point where they just didn't know what to do with it, and finally I'm like, even though I am out of contract and I don't owe you anything, I will pitch another series just so I can get that book back. And uh, this, is, this is how they get you. Yeah. So, and occasionally, some of those, some of the books that you're like, you you have this book, you know, uh, that's an amazing schedule of self pub and three books a year is because I had a book that I wrote years ago that has been sitting in limbo that I can just go, Storch, you fit in this spot here. So uh, that'll probably be one of those at some point. Excellent. Uh, Larry says, if you need some street cred, that I can do. Weird-ass, nonsensical, splashy covers. I've done covers for Bane. So, you know, high contrast. Plan on composition to be smothered by six fonts plus foil. <laughs> oh, God, Larry, I know. They look well. Yeah. Wow, this is just... So, I think this is like... Has uh, to happen. Yeah, yeah. It's gotta. Uh. <laughs> the thing is, and the, here, I'll go back to what I was saying. Bane covers, many of them, as presented to the viewer, are not what we would call great art, but they work beautifully well to tell you exactly what you are getting in the book. You know it's a Bane book, you know if it's military sci-fi or whatever, or fantasy, you know exactly what kind of book you are getting, so it actually works very well serviceably, sorry, uh, for what it is. It is, in that regard, a good cover. Damn it. 
Okay, I don't know the website Good Show, sir. I'm a little... But Larry says he got four Bane covers on there. I'm not sure where... I'm not sure. I'll, I'll look at it later. Um, we're back with anglerfish wearing a coat with its back to the camera. And they're easy to find oh. on the shelf. Bane books are easy to spot, yes. That is true. You might not know no, what happens in the book, but you know the genre. Awful SFF cover art. Oh, I'm sorry, Larry. But I guess if you did what the, what the, the art director wanted you to and you got paid, then I don't know. And if the book sold, then, you know. Exactly. I remember uh, seeing um, my copy of A Wrinkle in Time. I think it was. Yeah, it was A Wrinkle in Time. The copy I had in the 70s was featured on Paperback Paradise one day. Have you seen Paperback Paradise? Yeah, you have, because I got you the, the birds that I think are shit the story. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's Paperback Paradise, the, but they featured the the old armless was centaur. It the one with the centaur with the without rainbow. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the very masculine I, centaur without arms that's supposed to be one of the Mrs. Ladies. And uh, yeah, that that, yeah. that got named on Paperback Paradise that, that tweaked a lot of people because we're all like, wait a minute, I had that book. That that's not the one that 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 you should be laughing. You can't laugh at at Wrinkle in Time. Uh, Larry was not yeah. upset. I responded to them, and they thought it was the coolest thing. I know when I do something awful, and I'll own it. So I explained what the circumstances of the gig was, and we just basically laughed our asses off. But that that's excellent, Larry. I'm glad that you both had well-meaning, good, good experiences. If you're a there. cover artist, you are going to do some bad covers. It's okay. There are times when, you know, they want an army of uh, naked mole rats and a monkey and every character in their RPG group. And I'm like, okay, as long as the check clears. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. But, yeah, I don't know. It's, um... Well, we could do an entire Ditch Diggers about cover art and, uh... And uh, it's honestly probably worth doing someday. Uh, you might want something, uh, someone on other than me, although I am happy to jump in because I know enough about it to be dangerous. But, uh, yeah. The, um, yeah, I'd like to, to go get all of the uh, Six Wakes covers and put them, like, on a, a slideshow or something because people will see, like, the gorgeous... Japanese and Chinese covers and the inexplicable Korean cover that really looks like just a murder mystery. There's nothing that says um, space or clones or anything. It really does just look like a murder mystery type thing. And I'm wondering if I have any Korean readers who are just like, where the hell is all this space coming from? What the hell? <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I got to sign a Russian copy in... Uh, Ireland at Worldcon, and I didn't even get any copies of those. So I didn't get any author copies, so I got to see and sign a Russian copy of Six Weeks. That was very cool. But, um, yes, cover art discussion. All right, well, maybe that'll be the next, um, uh, maybe the one where I, I get can... Huh? The next time you have me on. Well, yeah, I can have can... you, and maybe we can invite Larry on. Larry, would you be open to, uh, Streaming on Ditch Diggers, perhaps. That would be cool. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that for August. Yay! Larry Dixon has agreed to to join us for the cover art discussion. So that should be fun. Um, yeah, I got lots of questions because I am not artistically minded at all. But we really should put a cap on this because this has been so much fun but unfortunately yes. uh i gotta let you get back to your day yeah i got i still gotta go write a thousand words uh i i am nearly done with uh for anyone who's liking the paladin books galen's book is nearly done i am just writing the final you know angst for reconciliation and uh gotta go write that and get some angst on all right i even awesome. wrote the sex scene already Good for you. You got it over with. You ate that frog. I don't think we should ever say, use the term ate that frog in regards to sex scenes ever again. Forget no. I said it. Yeah. Anyway. 
Um, Ursula, do you want to tell people where to find you online? Uh, yes. If you actually want a response in a timely fashion, go to Twitter. I'm Ursula V, U-R-S-U-L-A-V. Uh, I live on Twitter. It is, uh, if you have ADHD, Twitter is basically just a dopamine vending machine, and I am the little rat pressing the lever. Uh, so, uh, what? It's true. No, if you I'm, want, I'm with uh, you. If you want my website, uh, Red Wombat Studio, that has links to, I think, all of my current books. Uh, I actually updated it recently, and it will have, you know, links to buy them from most of the major retailers, uh, content warnings in case you're uh, concerned about uh, various content, and, uh, yeah, and that has both my stuff for adults as T. Kingfisher and my stuff for kids as Ursula Vernon, plus links to some of my art and uh, where to buy art and stuff like that. Uh, you could email me. I don't know if the contact form on the website is actually working these days, so uh, Twitter is good. Yeah, Excellent. I think that's Yeah, and all. if you want to see Ursula get into fights, watch Twitter, because that's fun, too. Man, I had a weird one yesterday. I don't think it was a fight. I think there was something genuinely, like, uh, not well with that individual. They, yeah, I, think uh, I heard about that. Yeah, they was it trigger warnings you should have put in there for stuff that wasn't in the book. Yeah, they they started yelling that I should have put in trigger warnings on the excerpt of the book for pedophilia and incest, and I'm like, but there isn't any in the book at all. And they were like, but you know, you can't tell that from this, and so there should be warnings. Okay, or your marketing should make it much clearer there is no incest in the book. And I'm like, how are you getting any of that? This is why this is not a thing and uh, then they just sort of deteriorated and I was like okay you have something going on that is not actually about me so <laughs> I'm gonna step away from this conversation because while I very much enjoy fighting with trolls I do not wish to fight with people who are genuinely having challenges so I was like Yep, just walking away from this one. Good luck. And uh, but yeah, if you want to see me, you know, get into a knockdown, drag out fight with somebody about whether or not you can grow vertic uh, corn vertically on the side of a building in quantities enough to feed civilization, Twitter's the place to be. <laughs> I really, really do. I do want to see all of that. Um... Anyway, if you are listening to this later, uh, you can always catch me on Twitch. Uh, I'm streaming by I Should Be Writing podcast and for the rest of the summer, Ditch Digger. Hopefully, uh, when we get back, Matt and I can also stick to a schedule that continues to stream because we're having a lot of fun. Uh, but you can find me at uh, twitch.tv slash mightymur. If you want to see my website and my other podcasts and projects and books, it's murverse.com. And if you want to support me, I am on Patreon, Jemmy, and Coffee. And uh, I'm trying to make all of those mostly similar, but each one maybe have something different because it's all a different type of service that maybe I should make that into another Ditch Diggers because it's really hard to come up with these like try to utilize all these services and not be too redundant, but also not make your fans think I've supported you on Patreon for three years and now you come up with something new I have to pay for? I don't know. I'm very It's a problem we, we run into. Uh, if you uh, would like to listen to more podcasts with me occasionally and my husband Kevin a lot, uh, Productivity Alchemy is also a place to go where he talks about uh, ways that people stay productive. And I know it sounds like... Uh, uh, organizer porn and sometimes it is that but <laughs> uh, he interviews a lot of people including me who have uh adhd various challenges who cannot make who think bullet journaling is a cult and uh there are uh it's basically life is hard things are complicated how can you get stuff done so you have more free time to lay on the couch and watch ted lasso kind of stuff so which is something and everyone should do every day. Yes. Um, and thank you to the uh, Kevin and uh, Larry in the chat. And thank you to Numbers Ninja, my moderator. And uh, thank you everybody who's hung out with us. This has been a very long podcast, but a very fun podcast. Um, I am going to do a raid to Space Valkyries because she has lots of fun and she's playing Mass Effect. So um, 
If you are hanging out for the raid, please put uh, hashtag Murraid. And, um, oh, thank you for the follow, Fuzzwolf. Um, oh, she's playing the finale. Awesome. So, uh, Wait. can't type and talk at the Ooh. same time. Okay. I, actually, I, didn't I program this? I don't freaking know. Um... Yes, I did. Ha ha! I have a button for that. Okay, so uh, if you are a subscriber, you could use some of the uh, chicken emotes for the Murraid. Otherwise, you could just say Murraid. Lovely seeing everybody. It's really good to be back. I appreciate all the welcome back notes. Um, and uh, I do have my evil Murbot saying Hugo Award voting is open. I am up for two categories, which is uh, Best Semi-Prozine and Best Short Form Editor. And Ursula, as we said earlier is up for um, uh, the Lodestar. Are you nominated for anything else? I forget. Yes, uh, yes. short story. For, short, uh, oh, yes, short, uh, just the short yeah. story one. Uh, for uh, uh, crap, what, Metal Like Blood in the Dark. Yes, that's, that's right, it. it was the really long one. Blood Like Metal in the, yeah, Dark Like Mud in yeah. the Metal and, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a Swedish death metal band uh, title kind of thing, but yes. Uh, yes, Kevin, I'm sorry. I've never shown you my chicken emotes. That's bad of me, but uh, yes. Um, Numbers Ninja did emotes for uh, Stardew Valley, so I have a void chicken emote and I've got a blue chicken emote. And my love emote is also uh, chicken-based because it's Shane from, um, Shane from Stardew Valley and his chicken, and his blue chicken that, that makes him happy. So we're going to Raid Valkyrie now. Thank you all very much. And I should be writing. We'll be tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Bye. You can support us at patreon.com slash mighty Ditch diggers. Theme song by Devo Spice. DevoSpice.com.